Hi, welcome to session three of Auditing 304, Regulatory Framework of Auditing. Every discipline or professional body survives with the existence of a formidable structure that is highly adhered to. Such structures support the control, direction, or implementation of a proposed course of action and rule of law. This session seeks to expose students to the legal and professional framework of auditing. At the end of the session, we expect students to be able to explain the regulatory framework empowering all the tests, explain the role of recognized supervisory bodies, examine the role of international bodies in the regulation of auditing, discuss relevant provisions of the company's code, describe their process of appointing and removing auditors. The session outline will be as follows. Now you are encouraged to get the BD Auditing and Assurance Services in Ghana and read chapter two and three to get more of this particular topic under discussion. And also the, session, the slides we're using and other auditing and assurance textbooks that will be available to you as a student. Regulatory framework of auditing. Various regulatory mechanisms affect the operations of a company and of auditing. So we are going to look at four main frameworks in this aspect. National legislation, industry-specific reg regulations, international regulations, and others. For like example, regulations on health, safety, and pollution. Now let's look at the national legislation. In Ghana, the company's code, that is at 19... Act 179, 1963, is the main legislation that governs or regulates the activities of companies in Ghana. So we, as we go on, we're going to look at the specific sessions and what it mandates. For example, session 123 of the code requires companies to keep proper books of account. Session 124, the company's code requires the directors to circulate annual report of the company to every member and debenture holders of the company every year or latest by the 18th month in the case of a new company. Section 133 of the code encourages that audit report must be addressed to members of the company. Section 134, 270 and 296 stipulates the qualification, appointment and remuneration of an auditor. So clearly seen, the company's code is the main legislative instrument or code that governs the activities of auditors in Ghana. Industry-specific regulations. Within the industry, an FM or an entity finds itself the specific regulation that governs or that guides its operations. And this is also the case for auditing. So the major professional accountancy bodies, such as the Association of Chartered Accountants, the ACCA, the Institute of Chartered Accountants, Ghana, the Chartered Institute of Public Accountants, US, and several such bodies, Worldwide constitute the recognized supervisory body that regulates the activities of auditing in their respective environment or jurisdiction. They have code of ethics or rules for members as a way of regulating their members. The rules are applicable to students, accountants as well. So in Ghana, the Institute of Chartered Accountants Ghana is the recognized supervisory body for professional accountants and auditing as a whole. International bodies, there are other international bodies that have come up with frameworks, rules that are supposed to guide the work of auditors. A number of international bodies also ensure in auditing standards which must be followed. For example, the Auditing Practice Board issues a statement of auditing standards, the practice notes and bulletin in the UK for auditing of companies in the UK and their subsidiaries. The International Auditing and Assurance Standards Board also issues international standards on auditing, which Ghana is a member and therefore applies the international standards of auditing in Ghana. There are other regulations as well. For example, agreements and covenants. Some, sometimes certain grants, aids or agreements come with rules and how the financial report on them should be audited. And therefore, you, the auditor, in respect of that engagement, must follow such agreements and covenants. Requirements of the company's code in Ghana. What is it? We're saying that this company code is the main legislative that governs or empowers auditors to go about in performing their function. The company's code, that is the Act 1963, Act 179, obliges every company 
to keep proper books of account. That is important. And therefore, to keep that proper books of account, auditors must audit it. The auditor's report must be attached to every company's account before it can be circulated to its members. Now, it is important, based on this code, to know who qualifies as an auditor in Ghana. To qualify as an auditor and to be appointed as an auditor of a private or public company, a person must be a member of ICA. That is the Institute of Chartered Accountants Ghana, and not be disqualified by any legislative instrument in Ghana. Then who cannot be an accountant or an auditor in Ghana? Our code says that an officer of a company or associated company, an infant, a person of an unsound mind, but here it must be determined by court that this person is indeed of an unsound mind, an undischarged bankrupt, a body corporate, and a partner of or an employee of an officer of a company. These cannot be auditors or appointed as auditors in Ghana. Who then appoints an auditor? By the company's, go, gen, uh, company's code generally, auditors are appointed by members, that is shareholders, mostly at annual general meetings. However, it might be noted that directors may appoint the first auditors of a company and fill any casual vacancy. Also, the registrar of companies can appoint an officer, an auditor, if the company has no auditor for three months continuously. Now let's look at, let's turn our attention to accepting an audit engagement. Remember the phases of auditing. The first phase was client and engagement acceptance. Now you have a client. Do you accept the service they are asking you to come and render for them or not? There are certain things you, the auditor, must go through and consider before you accept an engagement. What we are saying that before you accept an engagement, the auditor must ensure he has, appoint, he has been appointed in proper manner. This entails considering the following. One, ethical consideration. The audit fee, does it exceed 50% of your gross fees? There should be no financial involvement between the client and the audit firm. That is, there shouldn't be any financial interest. If this is done, it causes conflict of interest. So the auditor must position him itself or him or herself to deal with any conflict of interest. So there should not be any conflict of interest issue. The next point is that the auditor should consider legal issues. The auditor must be a member of ICA. Remember we said, based on our code, you cannot be appointed as an auditor if you are not a member of the Institute of Chartered Accountants. And if you have been disqualified by any statute, you cannot be. And therefore, the auditor must consider that a lot. The auditor should not be an officer or a servant of the company before accepting an appointment as an auditor. That is not done. Also, the auditor must consider practical issues. For example, consider the update fees vis-à-vis -vis the perceived risks of the work. Would the fees be able to cover the expenses in terms of the audit? The auditor must have adequate resources to conduct the audit. So if that audit engagement is far above the strength of your firm, do not accept the appointment. Take the one you have resources to consider. Secondly, we're saying that for you to accept an engagement, seek knowledge of the client business, understand the general economic environment of the client and specific factors pertaining to the entity. That is, you can source information about these from previous auditors, prior year financial statement, and so on and so forth. Thirdly, communicate with current and or outgoing auditors. Before you accept any audit work, it is important as an auditor to communicate with previous auditors. This is accepted as an ethical thing that needs to be done. When such Communication is declined. That is, the auditor is prevented from communicating to prior or previous auditors. The auditor may decline accepting the offer. This leads to us what we call the letter of etiquette. What is it? When there is a change of auditors, the new auditor has a legal and professional duty 
So here you see, it is not just ethically. We are saying that it's issues of legal. The auditor, the new auditor has legal and professional duty to seek or request the permission of the company to communicate with a retiring auditor by means of an etiquette letter. What is the purpose of this letter? One, to inform the retiring auditor of the nomination or as a matter of courtesy. Two, to ascertain whether there are any circumstances concerning the change which might influence the new auditor's acceptance of the offer. To request the present auditor to transfer books, papers, and information held by him unless he has right of learn to them. Post acceptance, what should the auditor do? The new auditor should ensure the outgoing auditor's removal is in accordance with the company's code. Remember, one day you also be removed. Where fees are outstanding, they should combine forces to secure payment for our going auditor. The new auditor should submit a letter of engagement. The new auditor on appointment should collect all books and documents belonging to the client. Letter of engagement. Remember we said there should be what? A letter of engagement. It is a letter sent by the auditor to their client at the beginning of a new audit. A letter that documents the agreement reached between the auditor and the client. Documentation is very important in auditing, and therefore there should be something on paper. This is what we are calling letter of engagement. It is normally written by the auditor to client before commencement of audit work. The form and content of audit engagement letters may vary for each client, but contain some general matters like this. So before we look at the general content, let's consider the purpose of letter of engagement. One, a document that sets out the terms of engagement, very important, confirms auditor's acceptance of the appointment and the scope of the audit, sets out the auditor's responsibilities to client and the form of any report. This one time when there are issues of the auditor's responsibilities, this document can, can, can become very handy. A reference document in times of conflict between the auditor and the client. These are some principal content, but not exhaustive, because we've already said the content may vary. But, but these are mainly some of the content of a letter of engagement. One, the objectives of the audit of financial statement will be stated. Management responsibilities for the financial statement, the scope of the audit, the form of any report or other communication or resource of engagement, unrestricted access to records, and so on and so forth. Don't forget, you need to read more. The auditor will request the client to confirm the terms of the engagement by acknowledging receipt of engagement letter. The auditor may have a meeting with key client personnel to discuss matters that may have significant effect on the financial statement. Remember, it's a letter, it's an agreement, and therefore sometimes in the courts there can be revisions. So we're saying that a revision of the engagement letter may be necessary where there is an indication that the client misunderstands the objective and scope of the audit. When at a point in time we are not having agreement as to what my job as an auditor is, we need to revisit our agreement and if the need be, make some changes. And if that happens, we have to also amend the letter and sign it as appropriate. There is a revised or special terms in the new engagement, a significant change in ownership. When ownership of the entity changes, auditors need to meet these old new owners to deal and trash some issues out. And so many other points that serves or bring about the revision of letters of engagement. Now, the auditor has a power to resign based on the company's code at 179 saying that the auditor must give a written notice of a re resignation to the company's registered office and registrar of companies. The auditor must request the company to circulate to all members a statement of circumstance surrounding his resignation. He must request the company to convene an emergency general meeting. Auditors can also be removed. As they are appointed, they can also be removed. And based on our code, these are some of the factors that may lead to the removal of auditors and the procedure it should follow. That is 
they cease to qualify for appointment, they resign. That is, auditors are removed when they cease to be qualified for appointment or when they resign themselves. Or when an ordinary resolution is duly passed at annual general meeting to remove them. And if this is the case, we are saying that there must be a resolution to remove or appoint a new auditor. The resolution should be passed by annual general meeting of the company. Written notice and statement from auditor should be given 14 days before AGM in respect of removal or replacement to all members. The auditor must be given the opportunity to be heard at annual general meeting when that auditor is being removed. Audit rotation. An individual who has played a significant role in an audit client is not eligible to continue in that role until some time has elapsed. This is to help ensure the independence of an auditor. We have two main rules here, time out rule and a 5-7 rule. The time out rule provides that an individual who has played a significant role in, an, in the audit of a particular audit client for five successive financial years is not eligible to continue to play a significant role unless the individual has not played such role for at least two successive years. That is, when you serve for five continuous years, you can take a break of that particular client for two years, and then if that client is given back to you, you can take after two successive years of non-engagement services with that client. The five seven rule is that yes, you are going to use or play with the five the seven years, but you are not going to work throughout the seven years consecutively. You work say three years, you take a one year break, you come again, you take some break. So that in the past seven years, five years have been covered. The application of the audit rotation is saying that audits of listed companies and listed schemes. Individuals who play a significant role in the audit of a listed company or listed schemes. If an individual auditor has been appointed as the auditor of a listed company or listed scheme, that individual and review auditor must rotate. If an audit firm or authorized audit firm has been appointed as the auditor of a company or a scheme, only the lead auditor and the review auditor, if any, must rotate. There are some problems with the rotation. For example, so practitioners cannot practice after 5-7 period because they're the only person and therefore there's nothing like this and it affects them. So small firms may not have adequate personnel to re rotate, hence may lose listed clients at the least in the interim. Now what are the duties of the auditor? We say that to form an opinion and report on the true and fairness of a company's financial statement, to make other special reports in various circumstances. So the first one that is the one of interest, since we are looking at financial statement audit for this course. Does the auditor have some right? Yes. Based on the company's code, the right of the auditor to assess at all times the books of account records and vouchers of the company, right to information, explanation and inquiries as they think necessary, right to attend AGMs and be heard, right to receive notice of impending removal and appointment and submit a written statement to be circulated to members, right to communicate with outgoing or retiring auditor before accepting appointment. I hope you remember letter of etiquette with this point. Okay, great. Let's move on. So we've looked at the regulatory frameworks. I entreat you to read more on it. And if there are any questions, you can always contact me on Sakai. Thank you and have a good day.